try to get us sped back up a little bit because we're running out of time. But uh, I'm, I'm Mark Beals, and uh, like John Denning, he manages at Potomac Garrett. I'm at Green Ridge State Forest, which is in Allegheny County. How many of you have been to Green Ridge? Oh, good number, huh? What brought you there? Grouse and Woodcock. Okay, excellent. I like that. I like that. Keep coming back. Well, John, John and I had talked about it a little bit a week or so ago when we were asked to do this and thought we really need to talk about that process because there's, I think a lot of times there's, you uh, know, you think, well, just public land and land. between us and say what can be done on the, on the WMA because of it, the things that John talked about with our certification going through uh, all of that process. But, it, you know, another, am I wired? Your, uh, <laughs> your neck's not thick enough. I know, and we didn't even do makeup. <laughs> uh, a, another subtle difference is that, you know, I, Myself, as a hunter, you know, and growing up, I always thought that too. Well, we're, I'm paying into this thing by buying a hunting license, and and uh, Pittman Robertson Fund money is going into it, and and uh, you know, I, so if I'm a hunter buying a license, buying sporting goods, that shoot, you should be putting this stuff on this ground for me all the time. How much of that funding do you think we see that in the Forest Service? Not much. How much? Basically, the way we see it is in our partnership what the wildlife folks do on the on the state forest we don't see any of that funding um, and along with that we uh, you know we do have a lot of user groups as John was describing that uh, you know I say well what are what is our job I'm a forester but you know my job's not really to manage the forest I, I say I'm that linear regression you take all those interest groups and let them come in and with uh, feedback and so forth and what they want to see done and you can imagine they're pretty conflicting and if you plot all those and then you try to hit that best fit line I guess I'm supposed to somehow be that best fit line and a lot of times that can be a, a difficult process. The other thing that he talked about was the process by uh, which our planning process and it takes a year and a half and, and that was something that I saw that was frustrating to us is if we had a group like RGS that came and said, hey, we'd like to do a project. Sure, let's, let's do it. When did you want to do it? Well, let's do it tomorrow. Well, you know, let's get it on the table now and in about a year and a half, maybe two years from now, we can actually get on the ground and get started. That's not very functional. So how, how do I run through these? Just hit the mouse button. The left one. There we go. And, and this is very similar, and I'll try to run through this, but we basically have the four zones, general forest management, high conservation value forest, and then you see there's another one here, it wasn't listed before, special wildlife habitat areas. Um, with something we were able to incorporate at Green Ridge the last time we did the reiteration for the long-term sustainable management plan. And it says special, wildlife habitat, we can thank Tom Matthews for that because he pointed out to us that we do wildlife habitat management on all of the acres, the entire 47,000 acres, and for the most part all management that we do is habitat management, but it's special because these are areas that have specific wildlife habitat management objectives, all right? And if you look at this on the, this is a map of the entire forest with uh, just the different layers laid in there. You can see there's three of these, right? Here's one of the special wildlife habitat areas, another one here, another one here, and then there's some smaller ones. To date, we have five of them identified. I think in total that's out of the 47,000 acres, they make up uh, between 2,500 and 3,000 acres. And there's potential probably to have additional ones of these. To date, the thing that makes it's different about these is we said we got to do that planning process. But what we've done with these special wildlife habitat areas is we've identified specific management objectives for those tracts of property. And then we developed another plan. Basically developed a long-term plan for that tract of property 
with specific objectives, and we ran that through that entire process that John described that we do with our annual work plans. And tied to that, the year that it's completed, tied to that year's annual work plan, so it goes through that planning process and review process. And once we get a signed, sealed, delivered management plan, then we've got it. So now, if you come to me with the project that you want to do, right, and it falls within the objectives of the plan for that special wildlife habitat area, come on, let's go put it on the ground. So that is one, one thing that we've started to do so that we can address some of those issues. Also, you can imagine that with, especially with early succession habitat management, you're doing intense management, there's a lot of stuff you need to be doing each year or uh, every other year or a frequency of, of going back in. That if we're developing all that into an annual plan every year, all I get done to one is writing the plans, you know? So the plan describes that every five years we're going to do this. I don't have to come back and put it in the annual work plan each time. And we can spend more time. I love to spend more time actually doing work. I used to, you know, in headquarters I get accused sometimes, Mark, you're just concerned about getting the work done. Because that's not, we're not allowed to think that way. <clears throat> so these areas were designated with specific wildlife habitat objectives. Six of them have been identified to date. Actually, three of them have, have uh, accepted plans, and the plans are, you know, are now attached to our long-term sustainable management plan. And they're available to all of you. I brought, I brought a copy of each one with me if anyone would like to look through one of these. But they're available to all of you on that web page, uh, our web page, to go into the, you got to go through the big stuffy long-term plan, but they're tied right to it, and you can pull these off and look at them and look at the specific uh, management that's described for these, for these units. One being the, uh, the first one that was completed was the Kirk Orchard management unit, and everyone that raised their hand and said they've been there recently, maybe that's where you've gone because it's been uh, publicized a good bit. We've got brochures that uh, uh, SCI and RGS helped us to uh, print out, and if you don't have these yet and you want them, they're up here, help yourself. Um, but that was the first one that was completed, which was early. The objective is basically for uh, early succession habitat perpetually. It's a 500 acre unit. And, uh, and then it, subsequently we, we coined it the uh, Woodcock demo area for Allegheny County when we needed one. Like Tom said, it was really doesn't seem like the ideal spot because there isn't water, but it sure seems like uh, the Woodcock are responding to it. And this is a shot of the, uh, the Kirk Orchard, just looking at all the different various units that we have in there. Uh, and I think the next one's just a, yeah. This is relatively uh, recent Google Earth. And to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we have done just in the recent year, the lighting in here, at least from my angle, I can't see it real good. But you see this, you see this, uh, area here that has, you know, you can tell it has trees on it. Hopefully from there they look darker. From here it all looks the same color, but darker. Those are overgrown uh, white pine, pl largely white pine. There's some Virginia pine plantations in there as well that were, were uh, planted in the 70s, I guess, uh, with the purpose of being windrows and, uh, and for habitat, but the problem is with early succession habitat, it doesn't last, right? They outgrow their welcome. And basically they were overgrown pine plantations. This area where it's a little bit lighter looked just like that. What's going on here is we had about 20 acres of this that we had harvested, and what you're seeing in this clearing is he started up here, and he's actually harvesting now, and right now if we had an image of it today, it would, all of this would look like that, and this, some of these plots over here as well would look just like that because they've been harvested. And then what we did, uh, not only did he harvest that to uh, basically get them out of there and let it start over, but he also took all the debris that wasn't merchantable, pushed it into windrows, made long windrow, huge brush piles uh, that were created with the debris, 
And then this past spring we came back, we had uh, drummer funds from uh, the year prior, I guess it was, for uh, uh, conifers to be purchased, to be planted for a thermal cover, and we planted approximately 8,000 uh, spruce in this area, leaving some of them as openings to create uh, perpetually more quarter acre singing grounds. A lot of it's to, to get new, uh, this time instead of using pine, we use spruce. And you know, that's a story in itself because frankly, spruce isn't a native plant to here, right? Other than red spruce up, in the, up on the plateau, uh, it's non-native. So typically nowadays we wouldn't even be permitting, you know, we wouldn't plant anything, it's non-native. But one of the things that we've been looking at is, well, what, what's the limiting factor? Why don't we have grouse here? is maybe maybe it's about winter thermal cover because we don't have a lot of we don't we don't have snow roosting because we don't have that much snow um, and we just don't have a lot of that real good winter thermal cover other habitat parts if you're familiar with Kirk Orchard you go there looking for grouse do you find grouse no I don't know why 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 do you think they're not there uh, I don't know but we thought maybe thermal cover has something to do with it maybe if we incorporate that could help some what, did we stand too long and it didn't like us doing that? Uh, so, but since the objective, specific objective being early succession of habitat, it was permitted through our uh, through the inter ID team and through certification and all that that we chose that, that species. This kind of zooms into that, that spot a little bit more and you can see these. We had also, before I talk about this one, we had also, uh, we planted the spruce, we did the openings for the singing grounds, but we also broke it up and in some of the series we have areas that have uh, more orchard plantings as well and we planted I think around 100 fruit trees and we've been doing that. We plant about 100 fruit trees down there, 50 to 100 a year for the last five or six years and we hope to perpetuate that as long as we find have someone that wants to give us some funding to buy the planting stock and, and we plant them with groups or we plant them with our staff. This is the, uh, this was the second, well actually this is the third one that's been uh, the plan that was completed and, and uh, adopted to the management plan. This is the Anthony's Ridge. This particular one, the objective was it's, it's approximately a thousand acres. It follows this ridge, right? And then we picked up this, this abandoned, more recent abandoned uh, ag area and tied those all together. You can see everything in, inside the polygon with the green is the management area and then there's some units that are already broken out within that unit. That's because they're ones that we already did treatment on and harvested. Uh, some of these were clear cut 2007 and some in 2010. Uh, this particular unit is 1,000 acres, largely ridge top. It's all basically all of this ridge was, we're starting out with a hundred hundred year old oak forest for the most part, okay? And the objective here is we took the uh, the rough grouse BMP for the Appalachian region and we took the gold wing warbler BMPs and I've tried to meld them into a, into a together into a plan. Those were the focus objectives, sort of, and uh, and Everything's about sustainability these days, right? Sustainability, sustainability. Take those and meld them to hopefully sustain that habitat within this unit in perpetuity, all right? So how do you do that? Well, we can't go out here and clear cut. We don't want to clear cut 900 acres. We could, and we might have good grouse habitat for uh, in five years from now and for the next 15 years, and it would be a debacle, right? But then after that, it becomes a biological desert for. 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years until it becomes mature and starts producing um, mass. So we don't take that approach. We take the approach of what's the ultimate, what's the ideal opening size for these creatures. Each little one, and what we were finding is uh, literature and all, people were saying five to, five to 25 acres. So what we've decided is, well, we've actually got about 500 acres that we can work on. Some of it's just way too steep that we can do traditional timber harvesting on. If you take that 500 acres, and the other thing is the rotation age, the year one from when we regenerate it to the next time we would regenerate it, right? We shrunk that. In our general forest area for Green Ridge, that's about 100 years. But that's because we want to make sure we get, uh, that's basically economic maturity, 
right? And economics isn't our objective here. These critters are objective. So we shrunk that to year 70. And so if you take that 500 acres, divide it by 70, and that'll tell you how many acres you could regenerate each year, right? And that comes out to about seven acres a year. Or in our case, we said, let's shoot for about 21 acres every three years. So we're not entering the stand each, each year. And ultimately, what would happen, and we also say, well, it's usually only good for five to 10 years. In Green Ridge, it's dry, it's scaly, things happen slower. I think it actually stays in that condition longer. We're probably good for up to 20 years. So if you run it that way, forever you would always have approximately 100 acres within this. And some of this would always be because it would be more intensely managed. So you're going to have about 100 acres plus some other areas that are, that are perpetually managed in such a way that you will always have that habitat, that ideal habitat in there. Just initially we need to do more work. Some other things we'll do is, you know, you can see it has this old road. We'll maintain that. We'll daylight it. If we look at the aerial of it, well, it doesn't show up too good here. but. But you can still see it. We're looking at this ridge here. You can see some of the openings. And you can see this road. And now if you, if you saw an image of it more, you, it would show up even better because we're doing day, daylighting. You know, in the old, old world of forestry, we used to talk about uh, wildlife corridors, right? Wildlife corridor areas where you don't cut so that you don't want to open the roads. You don't want to open it all up so that you have these travel corridors you know, of mature forest. Well, what about early successional species? Do they need mature forest to travel from one plot to the next? Oh, they want the similar habitat. So we're opening up and linking these, getting early succession forests along those roads, daylighting roads, the benefits of the roads and the forbs and stuff they can use as travel corridors from these blocks as we're cutting them. Yes? Yeah, so um, the road that's coming down from uh, a little bit west of well, the main road, yeah. the main road, this is Malcolm Road. Right. Is that what you're referring to? Well, well that'd be good, yeah. So yeah, this is a road that's open, open public road that basically comes across the ridge and down this way. But, but then on top of the ridge, this is basically just an old logging road. But is that closed off? Is that this is gated at both, end, both sides of this road where it crosses. Up on Malcolm. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's gated to the north and south of Malcolm Road. And it gives you another shot of it. Oh, this was something that we did. I was trying to illustrate some of the work we did just in this past year. And you can see some of these blocks, you know, that from the past. But here's one that the year before we daylighted. This past, if you saw it now, it would be daylighted from here out to the gate as well. And we've got another opening where we cleared here. And that was using one of our partners, which was Allegheny College. They run a harvesting program. In, in their curriculum every year to teach students about running harvesting equipment and all, and they needed a place to do it, so come on down. You know, it was good, cheap labor, and they daylighted those roads and create more habitat. In subsequent years, they'll be doing these harvests off of this end of it, and then they do about five or six acres a year, so it works out pretty good. The other thing that I wanted to point out here is this section. This was actually a younger stand. It was about 30 acres in unit, and it was actually, uh, I think, around 40 years old. So it wasn't very old, but it had met, uh, you heard me use the term biological desert. It was a pole stand. It wasn't really to the point that it's producing mast, and there really wasn't much in the understory. So from a habitat standpoint for, for grouse, I mean, there just really wasn't anything there for them. So what we did is we decided to cut it in half and this side we thinned to what we call the B level. It's basically the optimum uh, density for individual tree growth of all the trees in there. And it will stimulate gray growth, cause them to start developing mass to acorns, cherries sooner. Um, and the other side, we actually we cut a lot harder, thinned it, but we thinned it a lot harder and really regenerated. You'll get regeneration coming up in the understory. Um, but we left enough residuals basically to the Goldwing Warbler protocol of how many stems because they like to develop that tier structure. And the other thing is over time, I said you could 
clear cut each one of those units every 70 years, but about halfway in between there, at about 35 to 40 years, it reaches a point that we can actually send an operator in to those stands to do a thinning where it doesn't cost, it's what I call cost neutral, where they can get enough product off of it doing the thinning that they can afford to do it. We don't have to pay them and they're not paying us. So that's about the point where, where it happens. And the benefit is by that time, by the time the stand hits that 35 years, it's hit that biological desert, but we're opening up the canopy. It'll speed up the production of the existing trees. It'll put brush and some forbs and new regrowth on the, on the forest floor. So if you look at it that way, we can actually have more than 100 acres of, of uh, more ideal habitat at all times. All right. This is the third one I mentioned briefly. This is called the Casey Camp Bottoms. Uh, how many acres do we have? Does it say it is? It's about 381 acres. And this is a plan that was developed a couple of years ago. We've done some work. A lot of people don't even know, even people that know Green Ridge pretty good don't know this exists because generally speaking in Maryland, even where the state has, probably like at McKeeby Shears, you share the line, you got state line until you get to the canal, right? And that's generally the case and then it becomes federal property. Uh, Casey Camp Bottoms is an area where we actually have ownership. We don't own the canal, the canal's right here, right? But we own on both sides of the canal. So these fields and bottoms and bottom lands that are down there are actually public hunting land, all right? There's just a couple of places that you can access them because where you're allowed to permit, permitted to go across the CNO Canal with firearms, but you can access them. If uh, we talked about not having many wetlands in Allegheny County and you need wet soils and, and good earthworm production if you want to talk about woodcock. My opinion, you know, you guys that are enjoying the woodcock on, uh, on uh, Kirk Orchard, if we can get in here and do the work that we have slated to do in here, this should be the woodcock mecca. The problem is, you know, I describe all this work and well, I'll just, I'll just keep moving on with that and show you another. There's an aerial view. I kind of twists it a little bit. You can see those fields running the whole way up through here. Uh, some of these stands over here <coughs> are really mature, but they have a lot of understory potential still. It's a debacle of mess because there was disturbance way back when they were developing the canal. Um, but it could be improved. A lot of it's starting to be that there's not as much understory there. The problem is it's not an area where we would want to go in and do traditional woodcock where we do rotations and say, well, we're going to do clear, uh, strips of clear cutting um, because there are other sensitive species that utilize it. But what I think we can do and I'm hoping to do this, this coming year is to do some um, uh, use uneven management, which typically you wouldn't hear of using uneven management, thinnings, so to speak, or partial harvest for, for woodcock or for early succession habitat, but I think we can do it in here because you get those really, really big trees, you just bring a few of them out, it's still creating a large gap and you get flush of new vegetation underneath. But the thing that I find interesting in some of these stands is we have a lot of pawpaw. And pawpaw is sort of, in one sense, similar to the aspen in the sense that it, it uh, kind of clones and, and root suckers and stuff. But the other thing that's interesting about pawpaw is it's shade tolerant. It doesn't have to have full sunlight over top of it. And I noticed it by, we had a wind event go through a number of years ago, and a few trees came down, and in, in those little pockets, you see this pawpaw shooting. So I had visions of going in there and being able to do a thinning and just having Paul Paul come up dog hair thick. And I just think, I'm, and, and I'm not a woodcock, but I think if I were one, I'd just think that's just a mecca. <laughs> so that's TBA. I had another point that I would see. I should have stayed on that point I had a while ago, now it's gone, but it was probably a lie anyway. <laughs> since I forget. Some accomplishments summary just in the last year to give you some idea. 
Uh, we did the 30 acres of overgrown pine plantations restored, 8,000 spruce seedlings planted, 38 acres of timber stand improvement completed, 15 acres of warm season grass prescribed fires that we completed this past spring, approximately 100 acres seasonal mowing, uh, 100, approximately 100 fruit trees, approximately 100 pawpaw and persimmon planted, approximately uh, 100 established fruit trees. Yeah, that's one of our programs in our orchard lease is our established trees, go back in, release them, prune them, keep them vigorous, and then if we could just keep the bears out of them, but that's another, another story. Uh, acres of new brush piles created, uh, approximately five acres of road daylighting, frost seeding, clover, and fertilization. And that was just on the back of the napkin trying to remember what we did in these areas in the last year. So there's been more. And that doesn't necessarily seem like a, such a big significant amount, but to me it's, it's a fair amount because we, we didn't have, you know, if we would have had to have all these things listed in an annual work plan, you know, who would even thought, I had to try to remember what we did, right? It's be even worse if I had to remember, okay, what are we going to do? All these things. Because this is just on these wildlife, special wildlife habitat areas. We still have the other 47,000 acres and all these interests to, uh, to cater to as well. Some limitations. That brings me back to my point. Manpower. You know, I've, we're, we're operating 47,000 acres and I've got, uh, there's four full-time employees dedicated to the forest and then we get seasonal staff. Um, equipment, you know, the funding, I mean, we really don't have that much funding. We're, we get uh, funding for our salaries and then keeping, you know, we've got to keep restrooms going and that sort of thing and until we, until we do that, there's, there's not a lot to say, you know, we're going to go out and buy a piece of equipment or, or buy a lot of trees. I mean, we buy what we can, but it's, it's not a lot, you know. Um, and forest management priorities is a limitation. And that comes back to a number of people have hit on this. Is, you know, you guys are here, and that's great, because you want to hear about this stuff. We want to hear from you guys, too. Not necessarily, so, I like to hear from you, but that doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, it's the, it's the leadership hear from you. They hear that voice, because, I mean, let's just be frank. We, we, we still, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's the way we operate, and uh, to a certain extent. In, uh, in, in state government or any government, because someone's howling about it, we want this, we want this, you know, we have to respond because it's your force, right? And you guys want it. You just got to tell us, hey, we want it. We like it. We like what you did. Give us some more of it. So, and, and you know, and I also want to say thanks because I looked at, for many years, and we get these, uh, do the annual review, and you have the opportunity to comment. A lot of times, you know, I mean, most of the comments we get are, are canned comments in the past of, don't cut trees, don't cut trees. This year we had a lot that said, hey, we like this early succession of habitat work. I think you ought to do more early succession of habitat work. And I think that's because Dave and, and Linda sent that out, and you guys commented, and some people have commented and sent that stuff in. But, you know, and it's not, it, it's really not about to make us feel good. It's to make everyone feel good. Oh, well, and it's justification. Well, this is what the people are saying they want. Right, and then it it gives us impetus to be able to do it more. How can you help? Funding supplies and equipment, public support, what we were just talking about, and by all means, any time you want to, come on out and play. You know, we love to set that up, and we do. We've we've had a lot. Of, we wouldn't be we wouldn't get done what we have if it wasn't for the partners. And I think I've got some of those listed. You know. It, Partners, whether it's feet on the ground or with the with funding, um, so RGS, WMI, Allegheny College, Garrett College. I also it's another hat I wear as I teach uh, at at the college, and uh, that works kind of nice because it develops a nice partnership. Because guess where they do their labs <laughs> and and their wildlife techniques and and forestry classes. You know, they learn how to run a chainsaw and those kinds of things. Guess where their laboratory is, and and it's a real you know that the kids love it because they're getting to work on real stuff. It's not oh we got to take a chainsaw class. So I take them out in the yard and say okay cut this tree up and now chunk it up and 
you know, do all that. They're going to do the real stuff that they're learning to do. Um, and Allegheny County Forest Conservancy Board and uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we've got room for all kinds of, uh, of uh, new partners. And, uh, you know, it would be amazing some of them. We bring kids out to plant trees every year. A lot of times RGS is funded, or SCI is funded to get trees that we plant right in these place, in these locations, and we'll get kids come out from the schools to, to help us plant them. Other groups that just want to come and give back to the forest. So. And the last thing I'll mention is throw you a bone too. But you know, there's lots of potential for more of this. We've got those five that are slated. We still have two more of them that need the plans written on them. And then we're still trying to acquire property. And I'll throw you this bone. We acquired this, this farm right here last week. Look at the potential there. You know, but as Tom said, because I used to get really excited and crazy and I'll drive myself nuts because I want to be doing all this work on it. He said, you can't do it all. And he's right. We can't do it all. We're limited. Uh, there's to loads more potential. Would you like to have your name in the hat on what we should do with this? So, thank you, and 